No, this isn't an art tutorial video. There's no art here. I'm just gonna tell you what tool and setting does in Clip Studio Paint. Just gonna guide you through the UI. Cause there's a lot and it's overwhelming, especially if you're new to it. Hell, I've been using it for years and there's some stuff I had no idea existed until now. I'll be skipping over some things because as I said, there's a lot to it and I don't understand some of it. Timestamps in the description and there are subtitles because I can't talk properly. <laughs> Alright, Clip Studio Paint is a one-time payment art software. There's no subscriptions. Just pay it once and you'll use it for the rest of your life. Except for iPad. It's, it's subscription-based. I'll get to that in the iPad section. I highly recommend getting it during sale. The price drops a bunch and it happens a few times a year. And you'll know it's going on sale because every artist on every social platform is just going absolutely bonkers. Or you can just try out the free trial for now. There's Clip Studio Pro and X. Don't be fooled by the name. The X is the pro. The pro is not the pro. The pro is the regular one. The X is the pro. As in professional. Right, so the X just has more tools for comics and animation. If you want to do animation, I recommend getting X because like uh, on pro it's it's locked to only 25 frames. Not 25 frames per second, I'm talking about like you only have 25 frames to work with. As for comics, the pro's tools will suffice, but if you want to get into something more professional, get the X. And if you're just here for like illustrations, art, stuff like that, just go with the pro. I'll get into more visual differences of these both later in the video. Just a heads up, I will not be touching anything related to animation because I have absolutely no idea how it works in here. I'll, I'll show you like the panels and stuff, but the rest you go find another video or something. Oh yeah, on Windows when you install, there's only a shortcut to Clip Studio, not Clip Studio Paint. Yes, there's a difference between the two. I'll get to it in a second. Just right click, show folder location, Clip Studio Paint, and make a shortcut. For Mac on the launch pad, it'll already show both apps for you. You can just drag it to the dock if you plan to use it a lot. Right, so what the hell is this? Why is there two? Why is there Clip Studio and Clip Studio Paint? Okay, look at this first. This is Clip Studio. Just Clip Studio, not Paint. It's, it's kind of like a launcher. Wait, no, not really. It's it's where you manage your materials, assets, and files. Here you can manage your works if you want to keep them on Clip Studio's cloud as a backup in case your PC or Mac blows up, or if you're using more than one device. If you buy Clip Studio, your serial number can be used on two computers. If you go over to manage works, any files you have saved locally will appear here. For example, this file I made, I saved it to a folder and it appeared here. If I want to save the cloud, I just hit the slidey slide blue and it should show up in the cloud tab. And there it is. Personally, I don't use this because I draw on an iPad and uh, I save it to like cloud cloud, like Apple cloud. So this isn't useful for me. But if you're using a PC, highly recommend this. You get free 10 gigabytes right there. I don't know if the, how fast that'll fill up. I don't know if you can buy some more because I, I don't use this. Okay, moving on. Next here is where you can manage assets, which include like brushes, patterns, 3D models, etc. You can also do it in Paint, like in the actual Clip Studio Paint software instead of here. But maybe it's easier to do here? There's really no reason to manage your materials here unless you actually make stuff and upload to the asset site, I think. But I'll get into the material stuff later in the video. And the rest are help, tutorials, blah blah blah. This right here comes around once in a long while. It's a login bonus. You just gotta hit this button every day. And for each day, you'll get 15 clippy points. These points can be exchanged for materials and brushes on the asset site. And finally, we're going into Clip Studio Paint. You can just hit it right here. Or if you have the shortcut to Clip Studio Paint, you can just skip this and just go straight to Paint. Here's the terrible thing about the Mac version. It doesn't have a window frame. Like, like see, I can't, I can't move it around. If I swipe up, I can't. It just disappears. And apparently it's real finicky if you have like a second monitor or use screen tablets. Like you can't move it between screens. Or you can, but there's, it's, it's, it's really weird. Here, look at Windows and look at this. It, it has a frame. I can shrink. I can move it around. And back to Mac. Why? Moving on. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of panels and a lot of things here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull out all of these panels, pop up even the ones hidden in the Windows tab, and I'm going to go through each of them. I'm going to tell you what it does, what each little button does, and you decide if that's for you. If you want it, like say, if you learn what it does, what it is, and you like it, all you gotta do is just slap it to the side, left or right, or within another panel. Or if you don't use it, you can just close it. Okay, so starting off with layers. If you have your layer panel at the minimum size, you can stretch it out more to show two more buttons. There we have it. Okay, so the first row here, we got the 
layer colors. It's just to tag the layers with like colors, just, just as a reminder. Next to it is blending styles. You should know this. If not, play around with it. Uh, layer opacity. As for the next row, uh, you'll see here on the first layer I have a blue circle and on the second layer I have an orange circle. This first button here is to clip whatever that's on this layer to the layer below. So anything that's on layer 2, which is the orange circle, it'll only appear in whatever that's in the layer below it that is clipped to, which is the blue circle. Okay, so for these two, this one, this lighthouse icon sets it as a reference layer and the pencil icon will set it as a draft layer. It's like tagging it as a special type of layer to exclude it from doing other things. This will be better explained in this timestamp slapped on the screen right here. Next up we got lock layer. This is just to lock everything. You can't move it, you can't touch it. You can still move the layers around though, but you cannot do anything on it. This here locks transparency and if I do anything on the outside, it doesn't work. It'll only appear on what's already on the layer. So on this layer 2, it already has the orange circle. So say if I draw something, it'll only appear on the orange circle. These two here are just to enable showing or hiding the mask or the ruler. I'll get to the mask in a second. As for ruler, you can add a ruler by right clicking onto a layer and, and adding a ruler. It's a bit hard to use. This uh, perspective ruler is for when you're going to do backgrounds and perspectives and such. So see, once I clicked on that, it made a new layer, and when I drag, it'll automatically snap to perspectives. But I'm not sure how to use this. But you'll see here, it'll have options to show or hide it. This one here, which also appears in another panel, uh, is just to convert the colors of things on that layer to a specific color. You can set it to another color right here, but the default is blue. I use this when I start doing line art. I would press this onto my sketch, turn it into light blue, and then start the line art, just so I can differentiate between the sketch and the line art. Onto the last row, this here is just to show your layers in another panel. See, if I had like, say I'm working on 200 layers, here I can be on the top, and right here I can be on the bottom if I want to select layers on the bottom. It's just another view. This here is to create a raster layer. This here is to create a vector layer. In vector, you can do a bunch of settings with your brushes once you once you draw on a vector, say, see if I hold down command, all these little anchors will appear because this is vector. This is not raster, it is vector. That means I can edit it and shape it to however I want. I can also change the brush line on it. I can also change the width. But you know the difference between raster and vector? It, there's a difference. This, like Photoshop versus Illustrator, that's what it is. With vector, you can't use like watercolor brushes. You can, but you can't really blend the colors in because it's not counting it as like, it's paint. It's it's thinking of it as like an actual object, if, if that makes sense. Here on a raster layer, say I put blue down, I'll get orange down. I am able to mix them in a bit with the settings. If I have like a watercolor brush, that's because it is a raster layer. It's mixing the pixels in within each other. Okay, okay. Next up is folder. Obviously you just make a folder to store all your layers. This here is to merge whatever that's on the layer that has selected to the layer below but it keeps the layer. So this is useful, say, if I'm working on a multiply layer, I'm shading on something, I can just merge it down, then do more shading, merge it down, shade some more, merge it down. But with the one beside it, this will just merge it down and delete the layer that it was just on. Now with this one, this is masking. Okay, so with masking, anything that is white will be considered showing, and anything that is black is considered hidden. This is if you want to delete some parts of your layer, but you still want to keep it just in case. So if I turn my brush into transparency here and I erase this, you can see there's a line right here that I stroke down onto the layer. It appeared on the mask as black. So anything but that's black means it's hidden. But does that mean anything on the layer is gone? No. If I grab like any color, doesn't matter what color, go back to the mask, I can have it reappear again. Also, if you notice the check mark between the layer icon and the masking, that means they're both linked. So say if I wanted to erase a part, but I wanted to move this around a bit, if I go back to the original and move it around, it'll move both things around, yeah? If I take the check mark off, these two are considered separate things. So if I move the layer stuff, see the mask isn't moving. If I select the mask, only the mask is moving. There you have it. 
This here is just to apply whatever's on your mask to your layer. Uh, this is if you're very sure that whatever you've done on the mask, you're okay with it. You want to apply to it. See, I cannot, I can't go back and do any more edits. The erased hole down here is permanently there now. It's considered its own layer now. Lastly here is to delete the layer. Okay, so if I right click onto the layers panel, there'll be a bunch of options. Some of them are stuff that's already as a button right here, like new raster layer. With new layer, you got a bunch of other options. Raster layer, which is right here already, but it's here again for some reason. Vector layer, gradient, which obviously a gradient. It depends on the color that you have uh, on your foreground and background selected. So here I have orange and blue. The gradient that was created was orange and blue. Fill, this just fills it with a color. That's it. Next here is tone. This here is half tone, screen tone, you know, the comic dot stuff. You can actually choose like the shape as well. This is explained in another panel as well at this timestamp. And there it is. Frame border folder is for comics. It's also in this timestamp here. And 3D layer is just a 3D layer. There's no objects on here, but uh, if you want objects, you gotta drag it from a material panel, which is also in another <laughs> section at this timestamp here. Please go to that instead. Next up, correction layers. This is also all explained in another section. So, okay, so say if I have two layers and I click and I have the layer two selected, if I click this, it just makes a new folder with the layer selected inside of it. That's it. New layer mask. It's already up there. Ruler. I talked about that. File object. I don't know what this is. Layer settings. Next is selection from layer. Create selection. Uh, the easiest way is to just hold command or control and then click onto the layers thumbnail. And see here it has made a selection from whatever's on the layer. Convert layer. You can change it to color, gray, or monochrome. Gray just makes it grayscale. And monochrome just turns it to either black or white. Merge, 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 flatten. The merge one's already here and the flatten just flatten image just puts all the layers into one. That's it for layers. Layers are important, so I'm gonna snap it right here. Next up, layer property. Okay, so you see this little heart I've drawn. If I hit this one, the first one, let's see, this one is the border effect. You can adjust the thickness and the color. The paint bucket tool is just to put down the color that I have selected. Say the color I've selected is yellow, right? I can just click this and it'll apply the color. As for this one right here on the right, this one's more like a, a bevel effect. You can't choose the color, it'll just be a shaded color based off of what's on the layer itself. Okay, so I have this picture of a lotus. If I hit tone, it'll just apply screen tone to it. Lesser the frequency, the bigger the dots, more frequency, the smaller the dots. It'll look kind of weird on your screen, but it'll you'll have more clarity as you zoom in. You can use color of image, which just makes it black and white, or use brightness, which just makes it transparent. Posterization is if you want to adjust the black, gray, and whites of the image. You can just use the sliders here. So I'm adding more gray, less white. I can just click here to add another make more blacks or less gray, more white, kind of like that. Dot settings. You can change the shape of your dots. It's really cute. Let's go with star. Look at that. It's little stars. There's a lot of shapes for you to pick. You can twist the angle. These two settings are grayed out because they're only applied to the noise setting. So if I hit noise on this one, um, these settings will be unlocked and you can just change the noise size, noise factor. Okay, this is change layer color. It's exactly the same as the one on the layer panel. You can change the colors. You can change the sub color as well. And turn it off. This one here is to change your layer's color mode. It could be in color, in gray. This is for comics if you'd like. Or in monochrome. This is also for comics. So I actually use this panel a lot, so I'm going to put it with the layer panel. Next up is search layer. This is just to look for your layers in case you have like 300. So say I'm, if I'm looking for my all my raster layers, I can just tick here and see it shows my lotus layer. If I want to just look for my vector layer, it'll show up here. So and so. I don't I don't use this at all. Bye. 
All right, so next up we got sub tool and tool property. If you see on the left here, all these tools, each tool will have its own sub tool. It will have a tool within a tool. Yeah. So pen, we got different types of pens and there's markers, different types of markers. Go in pencil, there's pencil and pastels. Brushes will have its each different type of category and each category will have its own brushes. So there's like a lot in within each tool. Even with stuff like lasso or gradient. Yeah. So this is important. Got to keep this here. Tool property is just to adjust the settings of the tool that we have selected. So say G pen right here, I can change the brush size, opacity, stabilization. So these two are important. You got to keep them both. On sub tool, the first button here is to import brushes. You can also hit this one as well. This one came later. I don't know why they added this when there's already a button right here. If I've downloaded stuff before, it'll be in the download folder. I can add palette. There it is. This one's to duplicate. This one's to delete. And on the tool property, so I've messed with the settings and I want to revert to default, I can just hit this button right here. This one is for subtool detail. You can access it through window, subtool detail, or the wrench icon here. It's not an actual panel, so see, I can collapse this one right here, but not this one. This one can be snapped. This cannot. It is a pop-up window. This one here is basically the settings within the tool property panel. So there's a lot of settings, but some of them aren't used. So it'll be hidden within this panel right here. Say like um, color jitter. If I want to use that a lot and change it a lot, I can show it right here and have the settings pop up on the tool property on the left right there. If I'm going to be using it a lot, if not, I can just take it out. Or I can actually have it enabled, but not shown in case I don't want to mess with it a lot. I'll go through all of these um, in the tool section because each tool also has its different type of settings. You can do a lot of adjustments for uh, all your tools in Clip Studio. Close that. Slap this right here. Yeah, brush size in case you don't want. You can just adjust the size by holding Option Command or Control Alt holding it and then dragging across your screen, that is to change the brush size. Or if you want to use specific numbers, you can just hit this one as well. Next up, color. Color wheel. Obviously, gotta have that. It's, what do you want me to say about this? It, it, it's a color wheel. You got your foreground color and your background color. With some brushes, it'll apply both colors at once. So keep that in mind. This is transparency. If any brush you have selected, you can turn that into an eraser by just hitting the transparency here. You can switch the colors with X and switch to transparency with C. I like to keep this one at the top. Next up is color history. If you don't want to go through like doing the, the you know, having like a uh, color swatches at the side for yourself to reference instead of doing that, you can just go through your color history, so and so. I don't use this, getting it out. Color slider. I don't think I know anyone who uses this. RGB, HSV, and CMYK. You use this if you're attempting to work with print, I guess. I don't know. Get it out. Get it out. Color set. This is if you use like specific color palettes, schemes. You can actually hear the, the same download button right there as in like the brushes. Yeah, you can import them if you download a bunch of color schemes. Clip Studio Default also has a bunch of sets for you to use. Or you can just add your own if you're using like a... If you're drawing like the same characters over and over, you can just add a swatch and keep your palette. I use this sometimes. I'll keep it right here next to the color wheel. Next up, we got approximate color and immediate color. They're kind of similar somehow. If you don't want to mix colors yourself, you can just use this. Say you're using like green, hit that. And you're using blue and orange and I don't know, pink. You can just select the colors here because it's mixed all the colors for you. I don't use this. Get out. Approximate color is for the color that you have selected. And you want to change, shift, like tone, darkness. There you go. I don't use this. Okay, next up we got Navigator. This is just to see the overall image. In case you're working on something and you're super zoomed in and you need to see like the overall image, you can just look through the Navigator right here. It's got zoom in, zoom out, or you can hit the slidey slide. This is to zoom in at 100%. X is to rotate, or hit these. Revert back. You can flip horizontally, or vertically. I look at this sometimes, but not always, so I keep it on a separate tab right here on the left. Yeah, and I usually hide it. 
Next is subtool. This is really good for referencing and to pick up colors. Say like you're drawing something over and over or like, like a comic, you need like certain color palettes for your characters. Say I have like a uh, reference image, I can just hit open right here. And here's a reference sheet I made of one of my characters and I made a color palette right here. So if I hit this one, this color picker right here, I can just pick from this and continue to work. I can have like multiple, you see these arrows right here, if I put more images, I can flip through them. It'll be like this tiny like reference book for me. I can also like flip them, rotate, zoom in and out. So yeah, this is really useful, but I don't use it as much anymore, so close that out. Next is auto action. Okay, this is the magical hit one button and something happens. This is the default that comes with Clip Studio Paint. Say I've got this heart here, I can select bevel and emboss and hit play. And there, it did the effect for me. But just to keep in mind, it actually went through the whole process of doing stuff to make it happen. So if I show my history and go back to here, this is me opening the file drawing the heart and it actually goes through everything so if you want to undo say like an effect you can't just hit Control z and the whole thing disappears you'll actually have to go through all the process of undoing every little thing that it has done this one is really cool if you go through the asset site and download a bunch it saves up so much time next up i just showed you history so if you want to scroll through all your history you can do that if not close it out Information is just to show the location of your brush, like x-axis, y-axis. I don't know what this is. It's not useful for me. Out. Animation cells. I have no idea how animation works in Clip Studio Paint. So these are just the cells and the timeline is by default down here. I'll take that out because I don't use it at all. Last but not least, item bank. It's like if you have like your file, say I put the lotus image in here and I just want to drag and drop and use it a bunch, you can just do that. See, there's now a bunch of layers. It's just to keep your like stuff in there. I don't use this at all. Bye. So that's the panels. You've chosen your panels, you've slapped them all to the side, Pick the ones you like, you got your workspace, done. Ignore the stuff on the right for now, we're gonna go through the tools next. Okay, I've pulled out the tool property right here just so you can see that there's more settings within each tool. Magnifying glass, zoom in, zoom out. On the settings, you can pick to zoom in and zoom out. The drag, which would be the first one is to drag and it'll zoom in like this. The second one is to pick a specific area. And the last one is to disable that all. The shortcut is command or control on your keyboard, hold that and then press plus or minus. Or if you're using a MacBook with a trackpad, you can just use that as well. Next, hand. It's to move the canvas around. You can just hold the spacebar and do that as well. Rotate, you can also do that in the navigator. Okay, operation. We've got object. This one is used with 3D. Get to the 3D section later. Next is select layer. If you want to select all your layers. If I don't have anything selected and I drag, it'll select all the layers. See, I have two layers. One with the lotus and one with the heart. I made the heart layer a draft layer. So if I hit exclude draft layer and select again, it'll select everything except for draft layers. Next up is light table. I, I don't know what this is for, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the last one is edit timeline, which is for animation. Next is the move layer. This is just to move objects on the selected layer. Next up is move tone pattern, and the last one is move grid. I have no idea what these do, so moving on. We've got the lasso, which is just selections for rectangle, ellipse, lasso, polyline. And this one is to like draw a selection with a brush and just hit control D to deselect. Right, if we go to the tool properties, you can see these have uh, similar settings. The brush has got like brush settings. First one is if you make a selection and make a new one, it'll just replace it. This one here makes it so you can have many selections at once. This one here is to delete selections. This one here is to intersect selections. For the selection pen, we can change the brush size, the hardness, make it more like an airbrush, change the density, and stabilization. Uh, stabilization just makes your lines smoother. So see this compared to 100% stabilization. My brush is very slow and straight lines are made easier. Same with erase. Okay, next up we got the wand tool. I don't know what the difference is between the three, but I just use the first one. The setting right here is the same as the lasso. Here, close gap. Say if I go to my heart layer and there's a little hole. If I hit select, you can see that the selection bleeds outside of the heart because there's a hole. But if I turn on close gap and set the setting to high, it'll close that small gap and only select within inside the heart. 
right, tolerance, sets the range of color considered as the same color. So right now it's at zero, right? If I select right here, it'll only select that small pixel because it's considering like this white is different from the white right next to it. If I turn that higher, it'll say, oh, okay, all of these are the same color. If I turn that even higher, it'll think that, okay, pink and white, kind of the same. So see, it selected a lot of the petals right there. Area scaling is just to widen or narrow down the selection. So here at zero, it's right at the edge, right? If I increase the area scaling, you can see that the selection has widened out. If I put that in the minuses, it'll shrink down. You can turn this off if you don't use it as well. Okay, now I have three layers. The one on top is the purple, the middle is the green, and blue is in the background. If I select this one, uh, the wand tool will consider all these layers as one single image. If I hit select on the outside, you can see that it has selected on the outside of all three of these dots. If I pick the lighthouse one, yeah, you know, remember I said I talked about the lighthouse? It's for referencing one layer instead of multiple. To say I referenced on the purple, but I wanted to work on the blue and hit select. You can see it has selected on blue, the layer that I have selected, purple, the layer I have referenced, and ignored the green. For checkmark is just for layers that you have picked right here. So say I've selected purple right now, I've ticked on green, it'll select only purple and green. This one here is for multiple and reference is just for one. Why are there two options? This reference layer option is also used in something called colorize and a few other options, which is more complicated than just hitting check marks. And the last one is with folders. Next is the eyedropper. You can also just uh, hold Option or Alt to shortcut to eyedropper. But if we go here, the first one will pick up any color that it sees on screen. So see the color mix right here, it's kind of like a dark blue. If we pick it, it'll be a dark blue because that's what we see. But if I hit the second option here, it can't select anything. It immediately went to transparent. That's because on the layer, I only have this blue dot right here. So it only picks up stuff on that layer. Anything outside it, it's transparent. So it's picking up transparency. If I go to the purple layer that I've set to multiply and select the color from it, it actually picks up the color without the blending mode. It's kind of a darker purple, but the purple it picked up is kind of brighter. It's its actual color. This is good when you're doing shadings and you don't want to go back and switch your multiply layer back to normal in order to pick up the colors. You can just come to this tool right here, select the color, and then continue working. Right, okay, so next up brushes. These are the brush sections. They'll all have the same like subtool detail settings. All right. So first up we got pens. These are for line art. Markers for eh, markers. Pencil for sketching. Brushes for painting and blending colors and such. Uh, tone scraping. I don't know what this is. Pixely airbrush. All right. Next up is airbrush. Your brushy brushes. Okay, this is the decorative spray brushes. You got your effects, hatching, clothing, flower, lines. Uh, there's a bunch for you to download on the asset site. Next up, eraser. Lastly, the blur tool. And thanks to the new update, we now have liquify in Clip Studio Paint. Okay, you know your tools. Now we go to the settings. Okay, so say I've selected this pen right here. I go to subtool detail. First one, brush size. Next, ink, the opacity of the ink. Blending mode, this is say multiply and it only applies to the layer that you're working on. So see, it acts like working on a multiply layer, but the layer isn't multiply, it's just the brush. But color mixing, this is what makes it kind of like a watercolor brush. So the amount of paint, density of paint. All right, and color stretch is, say, it's at zero, right? And I drag the red across the yellow. It kind of like blends the colors a lot, but if I have it at 100%, it'll drag, it'll stretch the red that I've selected out a lot longer. Intensity of blur is if you have this selected it just it's just you know more settings for you to play with. Color jitter. This works best if you have like those material brushes to change the color for each dot of the brush. So say here I've adjusted the hue. It would work better say if I had like a spraying effect. Back to color jitter you can change the hue, saturation, luminosity, and blend with subcolor. Subcolor, my subcolor currently right now is selected to black, so that's why it looks darker because it's blending with black. If I turn this off, randomize per stroke, and turn up the hue, it'll just change the color with every stroke that I make. Hard to see, hold up. Yeah. Anti- oh, anti- change it from pixely to more soft. That's it. It's, wait, here, you can see it better on this. You can see the pixel edges right there. We'll make it more blurry. 
Brush shape, you can just pick one and hit apply if you'd like. Brush tip. This is if you have material. I'll talk about this in the material section, but there are materials that come with Clip Studio Paint. Say I pick this one, and the shape of the brush will turn to that that I've selected. I can have actually more than one. So it either mixes or if it's spraying, it'll be like different brushes all around. So it's swapping between the hexagon with the blurred circle that I've chosen. Thickness, make it flat. Or in different axes, I can swap it. Angle is just to, yeah, just change the angle. Just don't know what this is. Brush density is different from opacity as in. With opacity, each stroke you make is in a specific opacity. But if I have brush density down, it'll start as low opacity but gets darker the longer I stroke on it. So it's still kind of... So you can make it darker with just one single stroke, but unlike opacity, one stroke will always be that opacity. Spraying effect is spraying effect. Make it an airbrush. Particle density, make it thick, thin. Spray deviation is to make it closer towards the edge or the center. Particle size is just particle size. Go to stroke and if you select the first one, you can change the gaps between the spraying. Or if you don't have the spraying effect on and you go back to stroke, it'll just have a gap between your brush tip. I know what ribbon does, kind of, uh, if you have like a pattern brush that kind of goes on continuously. Kind of something like this, but not exactly. It's, it'll be like several images connected and you change the ribbon. It'll just change the way that the images are connected. Next up, texture. Uh, these are textures that come with Clip Studio, except for the first two. Yep. You see if I lower my opacity, you can actually see the textures. You can adjust it, the scale of the texture, rotation, brightness, contrast, etc. The ones with number two here is the same as the ones over here. It's only if you select this and you have two brushes combined to make like some sort of extravagant effect, I guess. Or to make it more like a real paintbrush or something. I wouldn't mess with that because I don't make brushes. Next up is watercolor edge. If I turn this up high, it'll have an edge. It's kind of like the border layer effect, except that the lines are still there, even though like these lines are overlapping. If you use it with these brushes and you turn it on, it'll have more of a watercolor effect because it's called Watercolor edge, of course. See? That looks kind of nicer and more realistic. The erase section is for the eraser. Skip that. Correction. Sharp angles is... Here it is without sharp angles. And here it is with sharp angles. As you can see, sharp angles. Uh, yeah, I've talked about soft stabilization before. It's just to, you know, make your line smoother. Post correction is another step of stabilization if you want it to correct itself to make it look kind of like neater. Taper is the end of your brush stroke to see how like thin it gets. I don't feel the difference really, so yeah. Enable snapping is with rulers. Starting and ending, I don't know what this is. <laughs> and anti-overflow, okay, check that on, right? I'll have this layer as normal and I'll set it to reference. Now I'll make a new layer. I'll pick blue. Ah, so even if my blue layer is on top, it does not go on top of my reference layer. How is this useful? I, I don't know. I, I can't think of a situation where I would use this. Yeah, that's it. Uh, these subtle details are the same for every brush down here, except for eraser. Let's go to the erase section right here. And let's say I make a new vector layer. If I pick the vector eraser here and change my brush to transparent, my anchors are still there even though I've erased it, it just disconnected it. You can see like each end has turned kind of more rounder. This one is just regular. This one though will delete all of the strokes that are intersecting each other. The last one will delete the entire stroke that I've made. Um, next to the brush size there will be this button right here. You can adjust the pen pressure and the tilt. You can also adjust the graph to adjust the pen pressure. If you need to delete an anchor, just drag it off. Right now for the last section, paint bucket. The layer on the bottom here, I've got the blue heart and the one on top is the green circle. Okay, so the same as the selection tool, we have the close gap. So if I have it off, 
it'll be like this if I have it on it'll close the gap right here tolerance as well area scaling if it's at negative positive now refer multiple is the same as well refer multiple to all layers will count the green circle as well see compared from this to having it off Works the same for referencing, selecting, and folder. This one is if you're using a vector layer and opacity. This here one is the same as like turning on the refer multiple, but instead of like having to checkbox this, you can just switch to this one instead. This one here is close and fill. You just drag to fill an area. And this one, paint unfilled area. So if I drag like this, it'll fill it in. I'm not quite sure how these work, but I always just use the first one. Next, gradients. Foreground and transparent. That means it'll gradient from foreground color to transparent. Foreground and background. There we go. And there's a lot more. You can also download and import if you have any. This one just changes it to a circle. This one is an oval. The first one is the edge. You can make it blurry. Make it lines. Blurred lines. One line. The one next to it, no idea what this is. These are your straight lines, curves, and shapes. You can also adjust some stuff, like for the square, you can, you can adjust the roundness of corners, the brush size. You can adjust the brush as well, so say if I pick this one, you look at that. Next to it is streamline. These just make lines, I guess. I, I guess? It also makes its own layers, apparently. Last one is like, you know, the the anime effect. The rest are if you just want to make like specific shapes. This one is brightness, it's a different effect. And this one is burst, which looks pretty cool. Next up we have comic panels. So unless you have like a comic file open with the grid lines, if you don't want to do that, you can also just use this. Once you drag, it'll create a comic frame. And as you can see here on the layers, it'll create its very own file with a masking layer. This layer is for you to draw on. This layer is its background color, solid background color. So yeah, I can draw on this and it doesn't go outside of the box. These are for different types of frames. I can just make a frame in any shape I want, or I can just draw one. This one is to cut frames if you want to divide them. You can adjust the gutter sizes as well. And again, it'll make its very own folder for each frame that is created. Next up, we got the ruler. So here's like some lines I made. If I pick a pen, it'll immediately snap to the ruler. There's all sorts of rulers. Perspective, like curve ruler, figure ruler, ruler pen, guide, perspective ruler. Moving on. We got your text. You can pick your fonts, change the, yeah, change the style, testify, yada yada. Next up is speech bubbles. You can change the brush size for the edges or have no edge at all. You can draw a balloon, make a balloon tail. Last one right here, we got correct line and remove dust. I don't know how remove dust works. I can't get it to work somehow. And correct line is for vector layers. I have a vector layer right here with some lines. Control point is just to select a specific anchor, move it around. This one will move a lot more around. Simplify will straighten them out. Connect will connect lines together. Correct line width. You can thicken them, narrow it down, scale by just brushing on top of them. Redraw vector line is just to stroke on top to reshape it. And lastly is to adjust the line width of the lines to the brush that you have right now. So this one, see, I'll, I'll make it kind of big. If I stroke on top, it'll make the lines bigger. If I pick a smaller brush, it'll be that exact same size as well. Okay, those are tools. Moving on to the menu bar. Here in the Clip Studio Paint one for Windows, it'll be all bunched into file at the bottom. Here we got just, you know, about, version, and in preferences, there's not really anything for you to be adjusting unless you know what you're doing. But I want to suggest one thing, which is interface right here. You can change your interface to be dark or bright. So if I pick dark color and I can adjust the brightness, make it light gray or dark gray. As for light color, that'll blind you. You can adjust the density right here. Next up is shortcut settings and anything can be a shortcut. Even auto action, say like this one I use a lot, I can just command something something and hit OK. That'll be my shortcut. Next is modifier key settings. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, just don't mess with this. Tabmate controller. This is Clip Studio's remote controller for shortcuts and stuff, if you have that. There's pen pressure settings. Say if you like have a heavy hand and you're always pressing down too hard, even though you need like lighter lines, you could change the graph a bit up. Just play around with it a lot. But if you don't, then just don't mess with it. 
Marion is Clip Studios' adjustable doll. It's their it's their doll, which yeah, if you look at this, it looks like if you adjust a pose, it can be applied to a 3D model. I guess I don't have it. This one's to open Clip Studio. Look at your license and blah blah blah, all the rest. File. We all know this stuff. Save, export. Right here is time lapse. If you want to record, you have to hit record first before you actually do your stuff. It won't automatically record like in, say, in Procreate. Because in Clip Studio, it, it'll make your file size super big and sometimes it'll take a toll on your device. It's the same recording. I've done it. I want to export it. I can export it. But if I hit record time lapse again, that means I want to stop recording and just delete everything. Now look at new. Okay, we're gonna look at new. Here you can choose to have an illustration canvas, a webtoon, comic, comic, but I don't know, and animation. Here you can pick some presets, or right here, pick a paper size, change the resolution, the DPI, and you can change it to have the whole file as color, gray, or monochrome. You can choose to start off with a transparent layer or a paper color. Paper color is a solid fill right here that you can change the color, but you can't draw on. It's just the background for you. You can also pick a template, usually they're for comics and such, and create moving illustration is just for animation. Webtoon settings are similar, and comics sizes will be in centimeters. Bleed width is depending on your publisher and DPI. You can start with monochrome, gray, or color. But look at this. Once I open it up, it'll automatically have this uh, grid right here. So you see this line right here? This is the actual page size. This here is just the bleed. And, and this one right here is the focus area. When you draw, you should have all everything mainly inside here, but it's not going to get cut off. It's just like where your eyes are at. So, and when you're making uh, comic frames, it'll automatically snap to it. See right here. And you can just continue make your comic. Uh, this one here, I have no idea what this is. And this one is for animation. Yeah, so that's the file tab. Next up is edit, undo, redo. Cut, copy, paste, and such. This delete, and there's smart smoothing. So say you got an image, you can use smart smoothing to smooth it out. Click OK. You can see before and after, it's been smoothened out. Fill is just to fill the entire layer with your selected foreground color. Advanced fill is just more options. So next up is colorize. What this does is it automatically colors for you. So if I pick the first option, it'll just color the line art for me. It didn't work with this one because I think the lines are too simplistic for it. Okay, I'll use uh, some of my other line art. This one is on Toma, colorize, colorize all. And this one, it'll just generate colors and fill in just on its own. It, it's really weird colors. It depends on like the art as well. I think for some pieces it will come out like looking great. For some it looks weird, just like this. But if we want to pick our own colors, what you do is you have your line art, right? You make another layer beneath and you pick some colors. Yeah, so just pick out your colors. Then set your layer, your line art layer to reference. Go back to your color and then hit use hint image and colorize. There we go. It's colored it in. A bit too blurry though. If it gets too blurry, you can just go back to settings and adjust the blur strength. And what it does, it'll create a new layer set to multiply. Here's what it looks like at normal, where it used the line art as reference and made some colors out of it. This kind of works if you have a painted or rendering type of art style where you need to bend a lot of colors. You can use this with your sketch to quicken the process. It really helps. Convert drawing to color. Don't know what that does. Convert brightness to opacity. Okay, this is very useful when doing stuff like I'll show you an example on how it can be used. So say like I have a border on and I do something say like shoelaces. The layer is still a border effect layer. See if I delete it, it'll still have borders on it. I have to actually rasterize this first. So I click rasterize. Now it's a normal layer. See when I delete it? That means it recognizes this is a flat image. If I go to edit and convert brightness to opacity, it'll change whatever that's white to transparent. It can now be used for line art. Okay, I'm gonna show you another tip because this is useful in saving your life. In case you merge your line art with your sketch, using Toma again as example. So see now, this is just one layer, the lines and the sketch has been combined. Say I accidentally do that. What I do is make a new layer, 
make a white background and merge it in. Then turn this to black and white. Then go to levels. I sketched with blue, so I made those blue into gray. And now that it's black and white, I can easily like adjust this. Make the lines pop out more, make the sketch disappear. Okay, now, as you can see, it is a single layer with just the lines. I can take out the white background now with convert brightness to opacity. There, I have now saved my lines. As for register material, this is for making material assets. Like, you can make a brush tip with this. So, say I drew a smiley face. And if you want to make this a brush tip, make sure it's just that and nothing else on the layer. If I accidentally, like, hit something right here, and I go to register image, see it's selected, like, the smiley and the dot. So undo that. Register material, image, and there's my smiley face. I take use for brush tip shape. I don't know what the rest are. And I'll save it to say like 3D motion because nothing's in that. I'll add a tag so I can search for it. Hit OK. And if I go to that folder, it's right here. Uh, more about materials will be in the materials section. If I go to the subtool detail on a random brush, go to brush tip, material, and search for what I tagged it as. And there it is. Select. Hit OK. Now my brush is a smiley face. And this is the only way that I know how to make brushes. I don't know how to make complex one, but these this just works. As for template, it's called a layer template and all the settings are grayed out. I'll save it to the same folder. And here it is. It just saved everything that's on my layer. Drag this over here. So here's the template that I just registered. It's for saving stuff on a layer if you want to use it a lot. Next up is tonal correction. Anything that you select from here will apply directly onto the layer, say brightness contrast. It happens to the image directly. But if you go to your layers, right click and new correction layer, brightness, it'll make a new layer. And what this does is it'll apply to everything on all layers that are below it. So if I have like 20 layers down here, more up here. It'll only apply this effect to layers below it down here. So first we've got brightness, contrast, you know that hue, saturation. Next up, posterization. If you've used um, Adobe Illustrator before, this is like the image trace thing. It'll separate colors into levels. So say two levels here, it'll pick up only like just a few colors. And the more you go, the more layers there are. Next is reverse gradient. It just inverts the color. That's it. Levels correction is like brightness contrast, except this is more in-depth, kind of. You can adjust the blacks, grays, and whites, and also in different channels of color. This is curves. You can adjust by RGB or separated channels. The left here is black, up here is white. So if I, say, went to the red channel and made an anchor right here and moved it up. So anything that is in the dark places, this place is darkest, it'll make it more red. Up here, if I slid this up, it'll make any bright parts red. If I did it down here, this will make anything that's gray, that's brightness is in the middle kind of, and I put that down, it'll make it more green, which is less red. Same applies to green or blue. Color balance. Separate in shadow, halftone, highlight, change your highlights, change your halftones, and change your shadow colors. Binarization is if you want to make an image black and white. Last one is gradient map. Uh, this is super useful if you start out your artwork in black and white. Here's an example. I made my image black and white. Go to gradient map and I want the darkest parts to be, say, dark blue, my mid-tones to be, like, greenish, and anything lighter than that is more orange, and any whites to be yellow. And this is what happens. Transform, you got... Well, if you go through these, it's just the same. You can just change the settings right here in the tool properties. You can flip it, just the image, and you can pick the mode right here instead of going through there. It's just a transform. Hold control command for like the edges to distort it. But there's also one more which is mesh transformation. This can be used to distort the image. Image resolution is just to shrink or enlarge your image. And change canvas is to crop. There is no crop button. You just change the canvas size just like that. 
this rotate, flip it, canvas properties. You can change the canvas properties, which will bring you up the window, like when you make a new file. Clear memory is just to clear your history in case your system cannot take it anymore. Like it's taking too much memory. This one here will give you an eyedropper to pick any color on your screen. That's it for edit. Next up, animation. I don't know anything about it. Moving on. For the layers tab, it's just the same as right clicking onto the layers panel. So it's the same thing. Select all to select the entire canvas. Oh, right. I forgot to show you this. When you select, there'll be this little bar right here on the bottom. These are shortcuts for selection. The first one is to deselect. Second one is to crop to selection. This one inverts the selection. So now it's, see it's selected the outside as well. This is to expand. Expand by like uh, 10 pixels. It, it expanded. This is to shrink. This is to clear anything that's inside the selection. This is to clear outside the selection. This is to cut from the layer and make a new layer. So see here, it cut from the selection and made a new layer with it. This one just copies, so the original layer still stays. This is to transform. This is to fill. And last one, I don't know what it is. For view, it's just the same stuff in the navigator. But in the view tab, you can you can change the viewings for webtoons. You can show a grid if you want to use that. You can change the grid settings. Next is filter. Blurs are just blurs. Your Gaussian blurs, motion blurs. Motion is just for a certain direction. Radial is in a circle. Correct line. Uh, this is for line art. So I've got my line. I go to correct line, adjust line width. I can make it thicker with this. See, compared to before, it's thicker. Or I can make it thinner, switching to narrow. If you're a bit messy or you imported like a sketch from paper and say there's like a lot of particles around, you can just go to correct line and remove dust. This tort is just a bunch of fun wibbly wobbly effects that you can play around with. Next is effect. This is for artistic. This just gives an image like a painted effect. Mosaic, which is uh, pixelating. Render. You can add noise to this, but this will apply to the entire layer. So be sure to make a new layer first. You can adjust some settings and set to something like overlay. There you go. It's texture. And lastly, sharpen. Next up is windows and we already went through that. Click help if you're feeling lost about everything. Okay, we're going to the materials now. Uh, the first one right here is just like shortcuts and stuff. I don't use it though. Can I take it out? Oh, I can. And these, all these buttons, the, it's the same panel. It's the material panel, except it's each of these folders separated here for some reason. Here are your materials. There's this bar right here. I want to get it out. It's just a description of each material. This is just to turn on the checkboxes. If you want to select multiple, turn that off. Small thumbnails or lists. I'll go with the big one. If I want to use a material, I can either just drag or hit this button right here and it'll apply to the layer. And I can also adjust the settings for it, hit favorite or delete it. These are just tags to easily search for stuff or just type it down here. I'm not using it, so move it all the way down here. Okay, so these are the default materials that come with Clip Studio. These are free for you to use, however you like. There's a bunch of them, and some of them might have a cloud icon. If that happens for you, you have to go to Clip Studio right here. Hit the settings and download additional materials now. It'll ask you, hit yes, and if you click over here, it'll show up the progress. It's a pretty big file, but yeah, it's worth it. So here in color pattern, we got our patterns. You can just drag them down. You can scale or rotate. Since it's a pattern, it can it, it's endless. It'll go on forever. But say if I want to draw on it, I can't. Have to right click and rasterize that. Next is effects, backgrounds. You got your schools, skies, and such, and texture. Here is monochromatic. This stuff is for comics, like screen tones, gradients, and such. Cross hatches, patterns, all in black and white. There's even backgrounds. Manga material. You got your frames, balloons, effects. Sound effects and signage. Just like patterns, you can just drag them on and use them however. As for image materials, these are tiny bits and pieces of material that is used in brushes. Say I pick a decorative brush, let's go to the settings of it. If we go to subtool detail and to brush tip, here you can see the material that has been used in 
this brush. Like I've shown you in the brush section. All these materials are in here. And anything you download will all just be here. Brushes, patterns, 3D assets, anything that you download will all be in the download folder. Anything you favorite will be here. Now let's move on to 3D. In 3D we have body types, poses, characters, small objects, backgrounds, motion, character parts, and character textures. For these three there's nothing and I don't know what it is. Let's go to the first one. Body type. You can pick a male body, female body, or this more realistic type of body. Okay, here's how to navigate through 3D in Clip Studio. You can pose out these 3D models to use as reference or to trace over. It's not wrong, it's not cheating, just use it. It's perfectly fine. So up here is to move the camera and move the object around. The first one, if I hold and drag around, it'll rotate the camera. But this one is already defaulted to clicking and dragging on the outside. If you do it on the second one, it'll pan the camera around. Third one is to zoom. Next up is to move the object, rotate the object. This one is to move the object while being fixed on the grid. Next up, if I click on the model, there's these balls, okay? These are anchor points and I can move it around. The lines are to rotate. But if I want to move a specific part, I can just hit on each part that I have highlighted and move it around. This one right here is to move the entire body. Okay, now for the bar down here. This one here just pops up the subtool detail. I'll get to that in a bit. This here changes the camera to a specific view. So say like this. This here centers on to the object. Say I had the object floating and I want it down on the ground. I can just hit this one. This is if I want to save a specific pose. Say I save it to the body type folder, and there it is. And if I want to use it again, I could just drag it down out here. There it is. This here is to flip. This here is to revert the pose back to default. This one here reverts the scale. Uh, I'll show you in a bit, but there's a way to change the scale. And if I want to go back and just hit this one, if I have rotated it, I can hit this to revert the rotation. I can also save the body shape that I have adjusted as a material, just like the pose. I'll show you that in a second. And this one right here, this one's pretty cool. This one is for you to open up an image and let the program pose from an image that you have selected. So say I open up a, an image of a woman running. This is the image. Hit open, let it render, and there it is. It's taken the pose from the picture and applied it to the model. But it doesn't always work, okay? So if I went with something weird like this yoga pose right here, you can see it doesn't really work. Not sure what these are, and the last one brings up the subtool detail again, but specifically on the body shape. Next up is all this. You can see I have to select the object tool first, and here are the settings. First up we got object scale and position. I can also change the visibility if I want to hide it, if there's too many objects. On this here we have perspective. This exaggerates the perspective. This here is if you want to apply light source and the shadow that's on the bottom right there. This here is to change the light direction. Okay, here you can change the height, head to body ratio. And in this chart, if I move it up, it'll have more muscle, down is less left is skinny and right is fat. And this here, once I've made an adjustment, I change the height and the body ratio and say if I like this, I can save this body shape as a material right here. As for posing, you can change the hand pose right here, but I'll show you better hand poses in just a second. Lastly, outline width, which is the outline on the body. Here in the subtool detail, there's a, just a few more settings, but nothing too advanced. Okay, so next up we got pose. There's entire pose and hand poses. This here, you can just drag and drop onto your model. Or if you don't have an existing model, it'll create a new model for you. As for hands as well, you can just drag and drop onto them. But if you want to change just one hand, make sure just one part is selected. For character, these are Clip Studio Paints' characters, in case you want to reference something with a more cartoonish anatomy. I just found out they actually have, like, physics. Next up are small 3D objects. You can trace these or do like a halftone filter on them to convert it to look more comical. There's a lot of stuff for you. You can also download stuff. And lastly, backgrounds. You can also just drag and drop. You can change the lighting or apply no lighting. You can zoom in, rotate around, and use this as a background. If you've downloaded 3D poses and models, you can move them to the 3D folder or not. But either way, using it is just the same. You can just drag and drop onto your canvas. Alright, so that's pretty much everything in Clip Studio Paint.
Moving on to the differences between the Pro and the X. I only have the X version on my iPad, but on desktop and iPad, it is exactly the same. Uh, so the differences between Pro and X is just comics and animation. On the animation tab, it's exactly the same, but on the X here, there is an extra tab for story. This is all for comics. Creating a new file, there will also be an extra icon, compared to the Pro right here. These are the comic options that the Pro has. As for X, you have a few more professional options. And this is what happens when I create a new file. This will be an overall of all the pages of the comic that I'm making. I can actually drag and move them around. I can go in and still see the overall of my comic. And down here is a small button. And what it does is create a 3D version of the comic that I'm making. So if I wanted to test it out, see what it looks like as on an actual book and see what it looks like with the bleed width cut off. Very useful. That's pretty much all the differences between the Pro and the X that I am aware of. There might be more options to use, but this is just what I can clearly see the differences between the two. Now let's get to downloading assets. You go to assets.clipstudio.com. There's a link in the description. Make sure you sign in right here and you're also signed into Clip Studio right here. Uh, so say I'm looking for a brush and I want free. I can go to popular to see what stuff most people have downloaded. Let's say I want this one. Hit download and it should uh, automatically pop into your Clip Studio. If you go over here, you can see, yep, it downloaded and it's complete. Go back to my material and there, it's downloaded. It's in my downloads folder. It's a brush, so I'm gonna go to the brushes, go to my subtools, add subtool, which is this one that I just downloaded. And there it is. Also, the asset site has a currency for materials that aren't free. These materials are usually more complex, has higher quality, just stuff that really makes making art a lot easier. There's gold and there's clippy. Both are a bit different, but their main purpose is to purchase materials. For gold, you can only acquire it by using real money. And with gold, you can use obviously to purchase assets or for paying for gold membership. You spend 200 gold a month for the gold membership. What you get is 1,500 clippy every month and your clippy does not expire. Clippy does expire. It expires in six months. As for Clippy, there's Clippy tokens and Clippy tickets. For Clippy tokens, you can use it to buy materials, gift it to other people, or expand the time limit on iPhone. To get Clippy tokens, you either become a gold member, you post material on the asset site, read the notes as well, and limited offer, which is launching the Clip Studio app, which is this one that I talked about earlier in the video. As for Clippy tickets, tickets can be used to redeem tokens. God, this is complicated. How to earn Clippy tickets? You post materials, you receive gifts. Yeah, but tickets and tokens, either way, they just become Clippy. Usually they're called points and you can just use it to buy materials. Before I get to the iPad, I'll show you the iPhone first because I don't like it and I'll show you why. Okay, so when you open up, you get free access for one hour every day, or you can sign up and pay for the subscription, or just log in if you already have the license. It's subscription-based, just like the iPad, but a lot cheaper. Mine is viewing in Thai baht, but here are the prices in US dollars. So here, opening up a new canvas, you can see that the UI is more compact and compressed. I honestly am so lost. I have no idea how any of this works. So I don't really recommend it. I'd say it's better to just use any one-time payment or free app that you can find on the App Store. The only reason that I have the app is just because I work on the iPad and I save my files to cloud. So if I say I'm on the go and I quickly need to adjust something, I can just open it up from the Files app, do just some really minor adjustments, and then save. Just, just in case. So just like the iPhone, the iPad is not a one-time payment. Uh, it is subscription-based and I think either it's Apple's fault or it is very hard to migrate an entire program onto an app. So they have to charge monthly. It's not too much though. Here are, my prices are in Thai, but I'll show like the US dollars. I think this is about $5 a month. It's okay if you're just using the Pro. If you have more than one device, you can also use this one. Or the premium plan for like four devices. If you wanna, I don't know, Split with friends. I don't know if that's possible. Or you have a lot of devices. So for the iPad version, as you can see, everything is exactly the same as on desktop. It even has the menu bars. All the UI is exactly the same. So there's no worry that just like the iPhone, it will be switching up to look more compact. You don't have to worry about that. It's the same except that it does have gestures, obviously because it's a touch screen. So see, if I draw, two fingers will undo, three fingers will redo. I can rotate, zoom in and out, and move the canvas around. A difference that you will notice is it'll have this button right here. If it's on, that means the fingers will only do the gestures. If you turn it off, 
your finger will be able to draw. This is if you don't have the pen. If you see the arrows on the side, I pick the third option. Here you will have options to customize the gestures. But if you need to use shortcuts, you can do that on the iPad by swiping on the side. You can either do the left or the right. Swiping once will give it this transparent look. Swiping again will actually have it permanently on the side. You can just take it off again by swiping it off. Here you have Escape, Control, Shift, Option, Command, and Space. Your necessary shortcut buttons. If I hold Command and Option, see I can resize my brush. Hold Space, I can move it around. Hold Command and move the things on my layer. There will be additional buttons of T1 to T6. These are customizable to whatever you like. I have it set to Undo, Redo, and Swap Color. You can customize a button by going to the Clip Studio, Shortcut Settings, and just pick whatever you like. Say I want Select All, I just add a shortcut, hit T4, or any button that I want, and hit OK. And there it works right now. Having these kind of work, and you can just access any tool or whatever through the menu bar. If you're migrating from a desktop to an iPad, it can be a bit weird because it looks exactly like it's on a desktop, but there's no keyboard. So I highly recommend getting a Bluetooth keyboard. This one, I bought it cheap on Shopee. It's off brand or whatever. This is just a personal preference. I just really like using keyboards because I use a lot of shortcuts, like not just undo or redo, but there's a lot of bunch of stuff when drawing. So I find it, it makes my quality of life really easier. But even just using these, this also just worked. Also something I really recommend if you're using the old gen iPads. The the first version of the pencil, it's kind of heavy at the end. And I feel a lot of times when I'm drawing, my hand will tilt back because it's so heavy. I have to balance it out with this silicone thing. So just get it cheaply off wherever you get it. I think you use Amazon, right? I use Choppy, so that's where I got it from. There's also a time-lapse button shortcut right here that I don't see on desktop. It just starts the recording. Tap it again to delete and turn off if you don't want it. If you do want to export it, you have to go to File, Time Lapse, and Export. So same with the Asset site. Uh, make sure you're logged in, hit the download button, and it'll automatically jump to the app. So make sure you're logged in at this as well. If you're not logged in, it'll tell you to log in. Then you gotta go back to the site and hit download again. So make sure you're logged in. And see it just downloads. And it appears right here. So that's it for the differences between the iPad and desktop. There's not a lot, just some stuff to keep in mind if you're using an iPad. So yeah, that's it. I'm so sorry for the audio being all over the place. I had so many issues recording this video and I'm just, I'm so done with it now. Uh, also so sorry that I skipped over some stuff. There's a lot of complicated things in the software and even though I looked at tutorials, I still don't understand. I don't have enough brain cells to comprehend it. If you have any suggestions for videos, please comment. I will attempt to make it. Thanks for watching and uh, follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram. Sub to my Patreon, it really helps. And that's it. Yeah, bye.